My name is Len Nichols. I am the director of the Health Policy Program at the New American Foundation, and I don't often give um, calorie advice, so don't worry. Uh, we are uh, uh, part of a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research institute, yada yada, you know all that. But we really are here to try to create space for a bipartisan conversation about health reform. And I am beyond thrilled to have before us this group we put together. Uh, health CEOs for Health Reform. The title itself uh, uh, speaks for itself. It's a group of people who run the organizations. And we are also extremely fortunate today to have with us Nancy Ann Mendeparle, who just wandered in. I'm so impressed, Nancy Ann, you know how to find your way down here. I was lost. I, had, I needed help. And um, Nancy Ann, I'll just say, among other things you know, she uh, is uh, the lead of the White House Office of Health Reform. She has actually run the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services back when it was HICPA. She also, I have to say, was my first real boss in health policy. I had the privilege of working under her at o and And when she knew me, I actually was truly a simple country health economist, which is what, of course, I try to be. But anyway, I'm so thrilled Nancy Ann is here because it signifies how important this issue is to our nation and to our country. So Nancy Ann, if you want to come and say just a few words. Thanks, Thanks so much, Lynn. And, uh, I see my friend Jane Moore back there, who used to be the person who took me around on Capitol Hill. I could use your help this afternoon, Jane. I'm headed over to the, back to the Senate after this. Um, I was thrilled when I saw uh, this group coming together as health CEOs for health reform. Um, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, this is a very serious group of people who actually serve patients. Uh, people like Rich Walters, who's a friend of mine who we served on MedPAC together for many years. Tony Tersini, who's well known for all the work that he's done. Gary Kaplan, I mean, all of you are people who know what it means to take care of patients, who know what it means to manage a budget, who know what it means to work with insurance companies and with the federal government in, uh, in receiving payment. And so I think it takes uh, a lot of courage and leadership uh, for them to devote their energy to this, what I think is a very noble endeavor, how do we uh, accomplish healthcare reform in this country that both lowers costs and covers all Americans. So we welcome uh, your, your support and what you're doing. And you're putting your money where your mouth is by doing the hard work of identifying uh, the the five to six hundred billion that you stay here could be achieved in Medicare alone over the next ten years if we really put our minds to it and reform the system. So uh, we embrace a lot of the ideas that you have here, such as um, uh, developing and transitioning towards bundled payment models, which is part of the president's uh, proposal. Um, accountable care organizations that accept full responsibility for high quality patient care. Um, requiring providers to meet explicit quality standards as a condition of payment. Um, working to eliminate the sustainable growth rate formula for determining physician payments and coming up with a better one. So all of those things are things that we also support and we uh, especially support creating clear incentives for providers, for the people who deliver care, to focus on quality and efficiency and that's why I think a serious group like this one can help uh, to develop those approaches that we can take forward in the future. So I want to thank you for the work you're doing to come forward here and to identify uh, these proposals as, as a way of our uh, going to the next step. And uh, we really look forward to working with all of you. And you're the leaders in your uh, sector. And so we look forward to working with all of you to move forward and implement not only your proposals, but health reform that lowers costs. <coughs> families and businesses and get to be covered. So thank you very much. Good to be here. Well, thanks again, Nancy Ann. Um, what I'd like to do is just very briefly outline some of the proposals here. I think all of you have a copy in your chair. If not, there certainly are more copies outside. And uh, I, I do recommend that you uh, take a few uh, moments and seriously um, look at them all. But just to give you the highlights, and I'll introduce everyone, and then we'll go through a sequence of presentations, and then we'll take your Q&A on Moss uh, at, at the end. 
basically what I'm, I think, most impressed with, as Nancy Ann just said, these folks are willing to put their own business models up to the looking glass and say, how might we realign incentives to better serve the patients we're serving now? How might we realign incentives to make our system work for everyone? But they also issue in this document, I think, some very clear and very bold statements like, fee for services we know it is unsustainable and therefore we should just be clear about that and start moving toward its eventual elimination. But to do so in a time frame that makes sense for real practitioners and real organizations and that allows us to learn, we must convey the seriousness of our commitment to this and there's a couple of concrete ideas in there about how to do that. The fundamental core of the payment reform section is of course about realigning incentives so that clinicians and patients have better incentives to make choices that are going to lead to better health and more efficient resource use. But what's great about having uh, a number of people who run real organizations is they understand all the impediments in the current system that are well beyond payment. Things like excessive regulatory burden in lots of different ways. Things like the need to in, in sort of invent an uh, office somewhere to coordinate, to teach the science of healthcare delivery that we need to really teach um, how people do better. And, and then the other great thing about this group is because they're in the real world, they won't let us forget Medicaid. So often in our discussions of health reform, we focus on exchanges and coverage, and competition among different kinds of health insurance plans, et cetera. And then we talk about Medicare and all the exciting payment cuts. But turns out Medicaid is actually our largest health insurance program. Of course, it serves the most vulnerable populations. And every serious health reform proposal of which I know talks about expanding Medicaid. So thinking about how to make Medicaid work even better is obviously uh, part of a wise uh, reform strategy. And then obviously the last piece of the reform agenda that I just want to mention is, again, based on their experience, the importance, indeed, even the urgency of figuring out how to reduce provider administrative costs and insurer administrative costs so that a lot of the wasted effort that's going on now can be streamlined and turn those resources into uh, better support of patient care. So let me just stop there and try to get away as soon as possible. But I want to introduce everyone very briefly. Um, you have uh, longer bios, but and I'll just uh, sort of go line by line here in the order in which they will appear uh, and speak today. First, Patricia Gabo. Uh, the CEO and medical director of Denver Health. Denver Health is an integrated system that uh, serves a largely uh, vulnerable population uh, that also gets extremely high quality uh, performance measures. Scott Armstrong, the president and CEO of Group Health Cooperative in Seattle, uh, probably one of the nation's longest uh, serving um, health insurer uh, organizations, came of course out of cooperative movement. That word is very popular right now, or at least interesting in D.C., so I'll leave that to you to define carefully. Uh, Nicholas Walter, a physician CEO of Billings Clinic uh, in Montana, which a lot of people, when I told people that I persuaded Nick to join the group, they said, oh yeah, Billings, that's Mayo West, right? So that's where it summarizes that. Tony Tresini, who runs the, the largest um, health uh, uh, hospital uh, uh, group in the nation. Uh, Ascension Health, he's the president and CEO, uh, based in St. Louis, we're very glad to have him. Gary Kaplan will then appear magically via video. He is actually in Tokyo, where he's taken another group of his clinicians to learn Toyota Methods, which by the way, both Virginia Mason and Denver Health have implemented in their hospitals. And Gary goes to Tokyo and teaches more people there, and then he also teaches um, Toyota stuff to the British and to different systems around the country. Wade Rose is representing Catholic Healthcare West. He's the Vice President for External and Government Relations. Catholic Healthcare West is another leading hospital system that's doing a lot of innovative things. Jane Horvath, Senior Director of Public Policy at Merck, is here to tell us about uh, why Merck is part of this group and what they see going forward. Mike Johnson, Public Policy Advisor for Blue Shield of California. The first health plan, to my knowledge, to come out in favor of being willing to accept a mandate, a regulation, if you had an individual mandate, which I think was done in 2002. So Mike comes from a, a, a long time visionary plan. What I will do now is just stop. We'll turn and go in order that we did, and then we'll take questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, could I have my slides? Well, I'm glad to be here, <laughs> even without my slides. <laughs> Well, I am glad to be here uh, and speak to this group. As we all know, American healthcare has serious shortcomings in access, cost, and quality, and health reform will need, will need to address all three issues for everybody, including the most vulnerable. And I want to touch on about three things that I think can propel us into this new frontier. The first is fixing the delivery system. We must move from our fragmented, very siloed model of care to an integrated model of care. And I think the creation of integrated public systems can <coughs> form a starting point for this integration. Integrated systems address access, cost, and quality because it, they provide multiple points of access. They give patients, particularly the vulnerable, other alternatives beside emergency rooms and even other alternatives and doctor's offices. It gets the patient <coughs> at the right place at the right time for the right level of care, which enables access, cost efficiency, and quality, and it gets health information to providers at the point of care. And the practice of medicine, make no mistake about it, is an information business. This is a picture of Denver Health's integrated system. And Denver has, over many years, been very bold about saying all the components of the public delivery model need to be integrated in a single enterprise. So you'll see the components here are Denver Health Medical Center, which is a dish hospital, the public health department for Denver, all the federally qualified health centers in Denver, all the school-based clinics in Denver, the poison and poison center, and the 911 system. This system is staffed by a single group of employed physicians, and the whole system is bound together by a single imaged electronic medical record with a single patient identifier and a single data warehouse for all the components of information. So <clears throat> how does this system provide access? Well, it serves one in four people in Denver. 35% of Denver's children use the system. But more importantly, it provides access for the most vulnerable. 70% of our patients are ethnic minorities, 30% for non-English speakers, and 85% are very poor. So does it control costs? Well, these are our Medicaid charges for the last available year, comparing Denver Health both per day and per stay to the other metropolitan hospitals, and our charges are about 30% lower. It is also cost efficient for the taxpayers. The tax subsidy to Denver Health is $27.5 million for $318 million of uninsured care. It's been the same amount for 19 years, and we've been in the black every one of those years. Does it provide quality? And here's the second point that we have to use. We have to be aggressive about implementing appropriate and effective HIT. Any HIT won't work. It has to be appropriate and effective. And this is using computerized provider order entry with standard order sets. Even though we're in the West, we don't believe it's every man on his own horse. So, when you have standard order sets, you achieve what you see here. All of our patients with an acute MI get 100% of the time each of the five components of the bundle of care for cardiac patients. And when you reach 100%, you have no ethnic diversity and disparity. This shows how you use HIT through registries to manage chronic disease. 
61% of our patients have their blood pressure controlled compared to 34% in the country. How do we do this? Well, when I actually was a real doctor and I took care of high blood pressure patients, if I wanted to map the blood pressure of a patient as you see at the top, I would have had to do that manually going through the chart. But now our doctors sitting in the room with the patient can on the screen show the patient the trend of their blood pressures. And when I was practicing, if I saw a blood pressure that was out of line like this patient, and I would say, are you taking your medicine? They always said yes. So I would change their medicine. But now, when they say yes to our doctors, they pull up their medication refills and say, gee, that's funny. You didn't fill your medicine at the time your blood pressure went up. And so now the patient can be engaged in a meaningful way. Why, why aren't they refilling their medicine? Is it cost? Is it side effects? It's this kind of collaboration at HIT and having access of information enables the doctor and the patient to have together. I also want to say another tool we have to use is to get rid of waste in our healthcare system. And we have to do it in an organized, structured manner. We have adopted lean or Toyota production and in less than three years, we have saved $25 million. And you'll see recently in the last six months, as we've gotten really good at that, the curve is going up and we're projecting to save 21 million in this year alone. This is by applying a disciplined, organized approach to getting rid of waste. So what can we learn from this? That integrated models of care within the public sector can care for the most vulnerable populations in a cost-effective manner, provide extremely high quality, and implement innovation. I think we have to start with some components. Not every place will be able to bring everything together our right way. But the core components by the DISH hospitals, the public health departments, the federally qualified health centers, and the school-based clinics. And then you use this model to flow your public patients through a health plan. So we need then to have payment models that drive towards integration, bundles to start with, but capitation ultimately. We need to take the funding streams that are growing in the public sector, like new money for community health centers, dish hospitals, school-based clinics, public health, and HIT, and preferentially drive them to those entities that are capable and willing to integrate, and public insurance to drive patients to high-performing integrated public systems. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would uh, just like to begin by telling you how pleased I am to be a part of this group. Uh, pleased because so many of us have been talking for years about how we can drive change in our healthcare delivery system. And I, for one, while it's overwhelming, and I want to thank all of you who I know are working very hard these days on, uh, on this uh, uh, huge task. I, for one, have optimism when the dialogue around reform begins to focus on how does our patient experience the care delivery system. Because I think once we begin creating alignment around how our care system can deliver on the kind of results that we hope it, it can and frankly that it should, uh, that is to me the magic to creating the kind of alignment that any reform will require out of us. And so it's really, uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be here and to talk a little bit about what we do at, at Group Health. Uh, I am President and CEO of a company called Group Health Cooperative. Uh, and amazing to me, uh, just a few years ago, we actually considered taking the word cooperative out of our name. Thank God we didn't. Uh, we, I uh, guess, are suddenly a very uh, interesting organization. Uh, I should make sure you know that we are an integrated care delivery and health plan system. So, in other words, we have 610,000 enrolled lives that enroll in a broad portfolio of uh, health plan products that we sell. But most of our clinical care is provided through our care delivery system, which is the largest integrated group practice in the Pacific Northwest, with 950 
physician providers caring for our patients through a network of 30 to 35 different medical centers, uh, literally spanning uh, the entire state of Washington and, and Northern Idaho. Our care delivery system, our health plan, our entire organization is focused on a single general outcome, and that is the promotion of better health and better results for those 610,000 people who entrust us with our care. And as a result, we are able to focus the great resources of this organization, but frankly, to deliver on some quite exceptional results. We are the lowest cost set of plans on average in the market. And by the way, Seattle, Western Washington is one of the lowest cost markets in the entire country. And at the same time, our quality and our service outcomes are the best in that market. And so, let me just tell a couple stories to bring to life, as Len referred to it as, the real world and what it is that uh, we do. There are many stories I could tell, but just a couple uh, that, I pick that I think give you a feel for how we do do our things uh, in group health. The first I'd like to talk about is, uh, fairly briefly, the decision we made to invest in a clinical uh, record, in, uh, uh, information technology that, that uh, creates an electronic uh, clinical record. More than eight years ago, we made this decision. Um, and today we have changed how we practice medicine in our organization. And beyond the impact on our providers and our care system, we have changed the way in which our patients are engaged in their own care. And, and uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about this. First, on the care system side, our, our care providers, whether they practice in primary care specialty in an urgent care center, whether they're answering telephones as a consulting nurse service in the middle of the night, they all have access to up to the second accurate information about our patient's clinical care. It improves the quality of those clinical decisions. It eliminates wasteful, redundant decisions thousands of times every single day. These are also not just doctors, as I uh, alluded to, these are nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists, these are hospitalists rounding on patients. And so not only is there a quality of decision, there's a coordination and integration of care across a care setting and over the course of time. It's a powerful tool, but I would also add, perhaps even more powerful, is that every one of our patients can get access to that clinical information from literally any computer in the world. People can look up their information, they can refill their prescriptions and have them mailed to their homes. They can look at their lab results. They can schedule an appointment with their doctor. They can uh, email their physician and expect a reply the next morning. Just uh, not to disclose too much about my own personal health problems, I would tell you my cholesterol is too high. And so my uh, doctor and I agreed I should get blood drawn and, and uh, check and see how my cholesterol has been changing. I went in early in, in the morning recently before work, blood was drawn, noon, my Blackberry tells me, my lab results are available online. So uh, later in the day, I look up my lab results and unfortunately my cholesterol has not gone down, but quickly I can see my results over the last few years and graph how they have changed or not changed in that period of time. That night, as I'm driving home, my Blackberry buzzes and tells me I've got a message from my primary care doctor. This is a true story, and this is available to all of our patients. He has looked at my lab results. He's sad to see that the cholesterol levels have not gone down. Uh, he said something about my weight, too. But, uh, and he said, we need to up your statins. I've already put the order in. They'll, they'll be mailed to your house in the next couple of days. People hear the story and they think, oh, you're kind of making that up. That's sort of visioning the future. I tell you, this has been happening every single day for group health patients. It's a way in which information technology, which is not such great technology, can be applied to an integrated system and deliver on incredible results. 65% of our patients now use this electronic uh, record, emailing their doctors. 25% of our primary care providers' interactions with our patients today, 25% are by email, are not visits to our emergency room. A fee-for-service payment system would never allow that to happen. The integration of our care delivery system enables this kind of innovation, and I would argue, as I said before, is the key in our care delivery system to delivering on the sort of reform that we all need. 
A second example <clears throat> um, of how integrated systems can deliver on exceptional results through changes that they have incentives to make is found in our primary care model. Uh, a lot of people are referring these days to the medical home. Uh, and so our version of the medical home uh, is something I briefly want to talk a little bit about. About 18 months or so ago, we acknowledged that we were seeing remarkable variation in overall results from one primary care clinic to another across our 30, 30 medical centers. Utilization rates, costs, even clinical quality were variant in ways that we couldn't explain. It didn't make any sense to us. And so we measured, we, we decided that investing in a primary care staffing model was one intervention we wanted to experiment to see if we could explain, understand, and control for some of those variables. We took one of our suburban medical centers, 10, 12,000 patients, chart-based there, and we made a laboratory out of it. We took baseline uh, statistics around cost, utilization, patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, quality indicators, uh, and then we rebuilt our staffing model. Uh, we reduced the number of patients paneled to each one of our primary care providers. We expanded the appointment time for every visit. We built into our schedules for our doctors telephone calls and email exchanges with our patients. We scheduled daily huddles in our clinics where the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and other staff got together every day, planned for the day, adjusted for unexpected things happening, and we organized lists of patients around chronic illnesses, patients who they were caring for who had not been seen in a while, and we found a way through those lists to get our patients in, to improve access, to fill up those 30-minute slots. And I'm here to tell you that after 12 months, we found some fairly spectacular results came out of this. So just a couple to mention. The visits to emergency departments for the same group of patients one year later dropped by 30%. The hospital admissions for the same group of patients one year to the next dropped by 11%. And I'll tell you, you have to spend a lot on primary care to overwhelm the reduction to your medical expense trend of those kind of changes in emergency room use and hospital use. So given these you know, very good results, we decided to invest tens of millions of dollars in, in, in expanding this primary care model to all 32 of our medical centers. We have a plan to complete that implementation in 18 months, which actually started about six months ago. Uh, and again, I will tell you, this is an experiment, a set of decisions, and an implementation process that will drive our medical expense trends down, that will improve the quality and satisfaction of our patients and that is made possible by the kind of integration and alignment of our care delivery system that this group of uh, organizations care so deeply about. Uh, thank you for letting me tell my stories, uh, and um, that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. On my way, uh, in D.C. yesterday, I ran into a friend of mine. He said, are you going back to D.C. again? Uh, are you still working on that health reform stuff? I said, yeah, I said, this is a, a, a new one that I've gotten involved in. It's um, trying to create a sense of urgency and a little bit more of an aggressive pathway to getting something done. He said, well, I hope you guys will do something. I said, well, we're trying. It's kind of complicated. He said, well, let me tell you a story about a friend of mine. And that's why I'm gotten interested in all this. Um, this friend of mine was having seizures and, and went uh, in, a, in a larger urban area, not in our state, and went to the emergency room. And uh, really no tests were done, but was, this friend was given some seizure medication. She went home but continued to have seizures. And six months or so later, she went to another institution where imaging studies were done and a tumor was diagnosed. A biopsy was done, and she was told she had incurable cancer, uh, and uh, was given radiation. Uh, she um, sold her home, sold her belongings, and moved back to her hometown. Uh, and many months went by, and she did not pass away. This 
So she went yet to another uh, physician who did another imaging study and saw uh, very abnormal results uh, and felt that perhaps this had just spread and progressed, but for whatever reason she hadn't passed away yet. She was referred to yet another uh, physician who did another biopsy which showed only radiation change but no existing tumor. The, the original biopsy was full uh, and had been inappropriately and accurately read as tumor when in fact it was benign. Uh, and uh, the happy news here is we have a person who is still alive. Uh, the unhappy news is the obvious. Uh, we had fragmented care, complete lack of communication, uh, and uh, we, we spent a lot of money on uh, a problem that really did not uh, need the type of attention that it got. Uh, this is a true story. It was a story that was told to me yesterday. Uh, I, I tell you this story in the context of the fact that we deliver a lot of tremendous, high-quality health care in the United States. There are many miracles that go on every single day, and we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. However, we do know that there's a tremendous opportunity for improvement in how health care is delivered in the United States, and there's a tremendous opportunity to do it at lower cost. Uh, there's a number of different ways of looking at this. But whether you look at comparisons to advanced European countries or comparisons to, from high cost spending areas of the United States to low cost areas of the United States, there is something like $500 billion per year, not over 10 years, but something like $500 billion per year that we could possibly not spend the way we're spending it today. We might be able to spend it on universal access, or we might be able to spend it on new emerging approaches to health care but we probably don't need to be spending it the way we do today. And my message today is, it's not a mystery what we need to do with health care reform. It's pretty clear. And on the provider side, we know how to do ICU bundles and put ventilator-acquired pneumonias down to zero. We know how to do uh, surgical infection control so that post-op infection rates are reduced to rates extremely uh, lower than they are today. We know how to manage populations of congestive heart failure and diabetes so that admission rates and spending per year on those advanced chronic diseases are much lower than they are today. We know how to take care of community acquired pneumonia differently. We know how to get all children immunizations. We know how to take care of the frail elderly in uh, capitated <coughs> programs like PACE. In my institution, we've reduced methicillin resistant staph or ACE infections by 60%. Uh, we know how to um, put uh, evidence-based medicine into order sets, as you've heard. We know how to do medication management, not just appropriately from a quality uh, set standpoint, but even management of the cost of medications for large populations like our VA system does, so that not only is medication treatment appropriate, but the cost of it is managed at a cost vastly lower than what we see in other sectors. So why is it that we can have all these things already happening in the current payment environment, delivering care efficiently in a high quality way, and yet it, we can't get this diffused on a more national scale. I, I once heard someone tell the story of scurvy. The, um, the knowledge that we could treat scurvy uh, came into being 250 years before widespread uh, treatment uh, and prevention of scurvy actually got implemented. So I think that's, uh, I suppose, in the nature of complex uh, organizations and complex human dynamics, but we don't really have 200 years to fix the problems we're facing today. But yet we know what to do. We know how to deliver care differently, and it is going to mean that the delivery system has to change and we need more integrated approaches to health care. They don't all have to be like Denver Health or Kaiser or Group Health or the Women's Clinic or the Mayo Clinic because we have now many uh, PHO and more virtual integrated approaches to healthcare that are also showing results and you'll we'll hear about that today. But we need to do it and we need to do it fairly quickly because we do not have a time frame longer than five or 10 years to deal with it is truly becoming not just a huge healthcare burden but a burden on our entire society in terms of cost uh, but also in terms of these uh, quality issues. Uh, we as providers, I think, have a particular responsibility to step up the plate right now 
and to deliver care differently and to be conscious of cost and quality and we can do both. In fact, we, that's an ethical responsibility that we should have. However, we need some help. We need help from policy makers. We do need do new payment models that will drive this. Uh, we need bundling. We need episode payment. We need mini capitation and yes, we need capitation. <laughs> We need to abandon failed policies which have done nothing but create uh, consternation and divisiveness and have kept us from focusing on policy that might really help. Uh, that An example of that would be the sustainable growth rate. Uh, we need to deal with perverse incentives. The, um, the, the ownership and self-referral and conflict of interest that is so rife in our system right now can't be uh, allowed to continue uh, the way that it's going because it is a diversion away from the right pathway. But we need some courage in Congress. We need some courage with regulators to help us with policies that can help uh, those of us that would like to transform uh, healthcare uh, uh, do it differently. And then we can't do this alone as providers. Uh, some say that $200 billion a year is spent on regulation and administrative costs. Well, if we're going to try to look for 25 or 30 percent improvement on the provider side and what we spend, why not on the administrative and regulatory side? Fifty billion dollars a year would go a long way to helping us uh, solve all these problems. We need help with pharmaceutical costs. Uh, we need help with IT policy and standards, which for all the talk we've had over the last seven or eight years, we've had very little really come into play that help us uh, who have to implement these things uh, deal with appropriate standards. And, and we need help with other things like all the money we're wasting on private fee-for-service and other places where we spend money that delivers absolutely no value back uh, into the system. Um, and then just to close, there's a lot um, right now out about health care reform in terms of what we're against. We're against the public plan. Um, we're, we're against government takeover. Uh, we're against something because it takes away my autonomy as an individual physician. We're against moving toward integrated systems because 85% of physicians are in very small practices. We're against these changes because they take away choice. We're against IT because it's too costly. But it's time to say what we're for, not what we're against. And what we're for is more organized, coordinated care that can be delivered more efficiently uh, at, at even higher quality levels, even though there's a lot of great things that are going on in American health care. So I think that uh, we know what to do, but the politics of getting it done is really complicated. Uh, but we need this group and we need all of you to help us work through that as I think the right ideas are now uh, coming onto the table. Thank you. I'm here today uh, representing Ascension Health because we believe things need to change uh, for the 47 million uninsured in this country. Ascension Health is the uh, largest nonprofit, largest Catholic health care provider in the United States with over 500 sites of care where we provide care across the country in 20 states of the District of Columbia. And in many of those communities, we are in fact the safety net provider. We train more residents than any other healthcare provider except the VA. We are convinced that we have a historic opportunity to enact healthcare reform that meets a goal of 100% access and 100% coverage. And Ascension Health is all about care that is affordable, accessible, coordinated, and safe. Within Ascension Health, we created about several years ago at an at-risk compensation program for our CEOs that requires them to collaborate in the community, to build community coalitions, and to increase the care to the poor, and especially those who are uninsured, until such time as we have health care reform in this country. Congress is grappling with some very tough issues regarding health care reform, and they are hearing from their constituents about legitimate concerns and worries about various aspects of the health reform proposals that are being discussed today vigorously. We are here today to help keep up the momentum and, and enthusiasm for reform. 
To be honest, uh, when I joined this coalition, I did so with some trepidation because it's the largest nonprofit healthcare system that includes a range of hospitals of varying sizes, urban, rural, suburban, <coughs> critical access, and teaching hospitals and clinics. I know that a one-size-fits-all policy does not fit all. And that is not what I believe we are proposing here today. We are not proposing that we can or should replicate one particular model, as Nick indicated. But what the white paper does say is that we can learn from each other on ways to improve care while at the same time lower the rate of growth in healthcare costs. Let me give you a couple of examples of an ambitious goal we started with in 2002. Actually, in 2003, Ascension Health committed to a transformation goal that states the care we deliver will be safe and effective, and that we commit to having excellent clinical care with no preventable injuries or deaths within five years, which would have been 2008. We exceeded our expectations by preventing more than 1,500 deaths through a clinical excellence program that achieved the following. Compared to national averages, we experienced a reduction in birth trauma of 77%, a reduction in neonatal mortality of 81%. Reduction in pressure ulcers from the national average of 95%. Reduction in serious falls and injuries of 53%. Reduction in bloodstream infections from the national rate of 36%. And a reduction in ventilator-associated pneumonia of 64%. Our Ascension Health's malpractice costs today are just 36% of total costs in 2004. Our system-wide readmission rate is 9% compared to a national readmission rate of 18%. And again, we achieved this across a microcosm of hospitals that includes critical access hospitals, inner city hospitals, rural hospitals, and academic teaching hospitals. The purpose of the facts was not to be boastful. The purpose of the facts was to show that the ability of a system the size and scope of Ascension Health to reach such performance levels and providing healthcare to the safe in just five years is proof that rapid improvements in clinical quality of care, patient satisfaction, better health, and efficient resource use are in fact possible. The white paper that is being released today is meant to spur further debate and discussion and hopefully bring a sense of optimism that the delivery system can indeed transform itself to provide better care to our patients especially the poor and vulnerable. I know that what we are proposing today may sound too ambitious, but I have to say that the CEOs of Ascension Health helped me understand the importance of what we're doing today. They sent me the following message. This paper won't spur debate. It will ignite it in exactly what we need. So I really stand here before you on behalf of 103,000 hardworking associates, employees within Ascension Health, 33,000 physicians who believe that healthcare reform should be centered on the patients we serve. As frontline providers of healthcare in the United States, we treat uninsured and underinsured patients every day in our hospitals for conditions that could have been avoided had they only received the right care at the right time, at the right place with the right outcome. Just by way of example, last year, every 38 seconds, one of our providers of care within Ascension Health took care of a new uninsured patient. Every 38 seconds. I'm excited about what the summer and fall will spring will bring. There is much work to be done to design a healthcare system that meets the needs of all Americans. But the opportunity exists and now is the time. Americans always have demonstrated that as our goal is clear, if our goal is clear, we will find a way to achieve it by working together. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share our story about the tremendous transformational efforts that have been undertaken by our healthcare system. And I also appreciate the opportunity to express Ascension Health's passion for delivery system reform so that America can move from having a healthcare financing policy to a true, to a true health care policy. By setting a clear goal of a health care system providing 100% access and 100% coverage, 
public and private groups can work together to ensure that all of us have the health care we need and deserve throughout our lives. Thank you. something that's a little different. We're going to have a video from our, our guest, uh, Gary Kaplan, who is... Um, I wish I could be there with you in person today, but I'm actually in Japan, leading a team of Virginia Mason board members, clinicians, and staff on a trip to learn even more about the potential the Toyota production system holds for transforming healthcare. Our healthcare system is burdened with waste which leads to poor quality and excessive costs. Nearly half of the $2.6 trillion in the U.S. healthcare system adds no value for patients and sometimes even causes harm. Over the past five years, the team at Virginia Mason has collaborated with major Puget Sound employers and health plans to redesign care for some of the most common and highest cost conditions. By providing rapid access to reliable, evidence-based care, we have increased quality while saving purchasers millions of dollars per year. Our newly formed Virginia Mason Institute is demonstrating that there is broad application for the tools of the Toyota production system in healthcare. We are gratified that organizations who have been working with us are experiencing early successes. Now we are ready to take our work to the next level. Our collective effort to reform healthcare must include realigned incentives. To support these realignments, providers will need to step up and partner with those who pay for care in both the public and private sectors. We need to design a payment system that actually pays for quality of services through the use of comparative effectiveness and evidence-based care and stops blindly paying for quantity. Health CEOs for Health Reform is ready to discuss specific ways that this can be accomplished. At Virginia Mason, we are committed to reducing the cost of care. And this work and commitment is energized by our demonstration that it is truly possible. We know the pathway to affordability is the pathway of safety, quality, and prompt access to care. I invite all of you, policymakers, health plans, employers, and patients to join with us in this important work. Now is the time for us to challenge the status quo. Now is the time to engage in meaningful reform to create a system that increases quality and safety while harnessing runaway costs. Our patients, our communities, and our country are depending on it. Thanks, Len. Um, Catholic Healthcare West is another West Coast provider here. Len has done a good job of making sure we get on a plane and are exhausted by the time we <laughs> We are the um, largest hospital organization in the West, and, uh, largest in California. Superlatives are we provide care to a population of about 22 million people. We're a nonprofit corporation that employs around 53,000 uh, people. We uh, are affiliated with around 10,000 physicians. We understand the healthcare issues both as an entity that provides care and as entities that pay for it. For instance, we spend about $385 million per year for healthcare benefits for our employees, and that amount is growing. And along with uh, our colleagues at Ascension, we represent about 75%, maybe a little bit more, of how healthcare is provided in America. And what that means is that as community hospitals working with solo to small uh, physician practices, and that is by far the majority of how care is provided, and it's because of that reason that we are the reason there needs to be health care reform. And that is because we represent a fragmented system. Now, it's, we, rep, now we are the um, historic entity, and we reflect what America has been doing for over a century, but it is not a system which can be su sustained given current financial models, and it is not a system which provides the quality of care which each one of you would expect to have where you get into a hospital and get treated by a doctor. And what you've heard today from uh, the speakers so far and my colleagues is that healthcare reform should not be perceived uh, as a problem or a threat. It should be perceived as an opportunity because it is the way we need to go in order to make things better for you. 
And in that instance, uh, CHW perceives the reform proposals that are being debated in Congress right now as, for the most part, and the vast majority, as very positive, and we applaud them. It is, they are going in the right direction. And we think, as a result, we would, if, if the bill is passed, or if a bill is passed and signed by the president, we will be gaining an era of change, which will make it better uh, for you and I, especially for me, since I'm now in that era where I can represent the majority of the cost coming in because I'm getting old and crank. So it's, it, it's, it's a good thing, and primarily because the, the proposals are moving toward greater systemization of health care and less fragmentation. And we've heard uh, from our uh, presenters already what the benefit of that is. What the benefit generally is of that is that people will have better sense of the care they need to be provided, the value of the care was uh, that was provided and what the cost was. And it's because of that little triangulation that we're going to be able to bring costs down and move quality up. And as we all know, the higher healthcare costs, the less access there is. And that's the fundamental moral problem with increasing costs in healthcare is it decreases access and it decreases quality and that is not sustainable. CHW has been attempting to do what we can, given our fragmented nature, uh, to move things forward in a way which you've also heard about. Uh, uh, two years ago, almost a year ago, we worked with Mayor Gavin Newsom in San Francisco, and we co-led the development of a, health, a plan called Healthy San Francisco, which is the nation's first universal health care program sponsored by a city. And that's a med it's based upon a uh, medical home model, and that is succeeding now it's almost covering about uh, 60,000 people uh, out of about 70,000 people who are uh, believed to be without insurance in San Francisco. We represent the largest Medicaid, we run the largest Medicaid managed care program in the country, and that's called Mercy Care, and that's based in Phoenix, about 300,000 miles. <coughs> in and itself is an integrated health system, and we are sponsoring the Universal Care Program uh, in Nevada, which has started in you know, is now going to Las Vegas. From the perspective of our organization, and which represents the majority of how healthcare is provided in America, we applaud the efforts of Congress, and we applaud the effort that the Obama administration, President Obama, is making to make things better for us, and at least open the door to a better world. And I want to end with that, to, that the characterization of healthcare reform as a kind of a negative, constraining, fearful problem. It is a mischaracterization. Healthcare reform is the opening the door to a great opportunity so that life is better for all of us. And uh, as soon as we can get there, the better. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, and I my name is Jane Horvath, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Merv appreciates the opportunity to be a participant in this group. And um, I wanted to thank Len and all of his staff for bringing us all together. And I wanted to thank my colleagues uh, in the organization for all of their um, commitment to this issue and their creativity around all the very complicated issues in healthcare reform. And I was asked to talk about two things today, briefly, and that will be brief. Um, why does Merck believe that delivery system reforms are possible? And then the second question was, what has Merck done that demonstrates that change is possible? Um, and I think why Merck believes that system delivery and healthcare reform in general is possible is that, I think it's obvious to everyone, including Merck actually, that uh, there's internal and external pressures that have become um, untenable on the system, um, cost pressures and access pressures. And that there's a general affirmation, as we've heard over and over again today, that the system spends considerable sums of money and we're not exactly sure what we get for our spending. Um, and it seems to us, um, particularly here in D.C. anyway, that um, there is a willingness of, of to, among many players and many stakeholders to take a fresh look at the issues. And I think the Health CEOs for Health Reform is you know, at the center of that movement and sort of epitomizes the, the far end of taking a fresh look at things and stepping out of the box. And for Merck ourselves, it was last year, um, almost two years ago now actually, that 
Merck decided we would break with the traditions of our company and our industry peer group um, and try to figure out a way to get to yes on some of these questions and deal with some of the what had been very politically difficult questions in the past. Um, and we had decided that we would be able to support impair, employer pay or play mandates, individual mandates, changes to the tax code that would create sort of overall cost containment on the system, restore market incentives, that we would support price transparency at the point of service, um, and that we would support expansion of public programs to take care of the most vulnerable populations and improvements in those programs. And those, and the whole set of political questions um, on the table today are different than when we started this process. We looked at what were the real stumbling blocks 15 years ago um, and addressed those issues. So um, that's, that's sort of why we think system delivery reform is possible because there are other companies like ourselves and obviously all our colleagues here uh, willing to step down. And then what has Merck done that demonstrates that change is possible. And here I'm going to go back a little bit, which is um, a number of years ago now, Merck decided that we needed to be supportive of comparative effectiveness research. At the time, we were all really talking about evidence-based medicine, but it was evidence of one intervention versus another. Uh, and Merck saw that this was going to be an increasingly important tool for payers and patients and providers in order, you know, an effective and rational tool and information set by which to optimize coverage policy and treatment decisions. Um, and I, I say coverage policy because I think that that's important and that is still a sort of um, a, um, a rift in the debate, if you will. There's not complete consensus, but Merck certainly believes that um, evidence-based medicine comparative effectiveness should and could be used for coverage decisions. Um, and we believe that uh, CER itself is going to make the market more competitive around value, and we ultimately believe that that's where we need to go. Um, it values improving quality and constraining cost at the same time, and CER is a tool to get us there. Merck, because of all this, Merck was an early backer on some two U.S. initiatives that actually helped to bring us where we are today in the U.S. debate on comparative effectiveness. We worked with insurers and researchers on a group called the EBM Roadmap Group, uh, where with health plans and researchers and other folks of interest, we work to develop a way of assessing sort of the strength of the evidence relative to the research question being posed. Uh, and it's a whole thing we can talk about later, but it was early work in this area. And then we were early supporters of the Massachusetts-based Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, ICER, that some of you know if you're familiar with this issue. Um, and then we've also looked at innovative ways uh, to respond to payer interests in this area, payer and patient interests. And I, you know, obviously our work is far from com complete in this area, but I would point to this um, innovative performance-based contract that we just executed recently with Cigna Insurance. Um, where we're looking at the di diabetic supporting Cigna and looking at their entire role base of diabetics, anybody taking oral diabetic medications, and not Merck diabetic medications, any diabetic on an oral. And we're supporting Cigna in getting as many of their enrollees to treatment goals as possible. And our, we're supporting them in, in, as they reach treatment goal for broader and broader, the price of our products goes down. So there's an incentive there, it's supporting Sigma in doing it and trying to reach the best outcome for all patients, not just people on our medicines. Because so I think, you know, we think for the future of healthcare that um, it's our role to try to work with providers and obviously the environment for providers and payers is going to be changing as new quality metrics come into play and new performance measures. And Merck is trying to figure out how to demonstrate the value, provide value, increase the value of what we get out of the system by thinking of innovative ways to, to be in the market. So. quietly sat through what nine, ten speakers already, so I'm going to be extremely brief. Uh, my name is Mike Johnson. I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Blue Shield of California CEO Bruce Badatkin. He's, he's, uh, he's got a written statement that I think was distributed with the materials we've got. 
Um, and Bruce wanted me just to reiterate two points. One is that uh, if healthcare reform is going to be successful over the long term, that we have to be as ambitious about payment system reform as we are about a lot of the access proposals that people have come to embrace. And that, you know, it's, it's uh, critical that we've set as a goal expanding health insurance coverage to everybody. It is equally as important that we set a hard and fast deadline for ending um, a fee-for-service payment and moving to a system of payment that rewards outcomes and quality. The second point that he wanted me to make is just to tell you about a pilot project that we've recently launched that we think is going to provide a, a dra dramatic illustration of the power of incentives to to drive efficiency and effectiveness improvements in healthcare delivery. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a project that we've launched with uh, Catholic Healthcare West and uh, uh, Hill Physicians, which is one of the largest medical groups in California. And under this project, what we've done is um, we've reached an agreement with the California Public Employees Retirement System, which is our largest customer and the, the second largest purchaser of healthcare in the country that if we can uh, uh, bring health care costs in for, for their members in the Sacramento area in 2009, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2010, at levels below 2010, uh, 2009 rates. So in 2010, if we can deliver health care for less than we did in 2009, that our three organizations will share in the savings. If the costs are above that threshold, and then the three organizations will bear uh, response, each bear responsibility for a portion of those costs. And so now, for the first time, we've got a situation where all three of us have uh, an incentive to drive costs down across the entire delivery system, rather than just trying to push costs off onto each other or onto some other segment of the delivery system. And as a result, we've now got teams from our three organizations that are kind of working overtime on initiatives. They've now got about 100 different initiatives under development to try and figure out how collectively we can deliver care more efficiently and uh, uh, more effectively. And you know, these, these, all of these initiatives are still underway. And I think the, you know, the critical point to take away from this is that um, you don't have to have all of this stuff figured out before you, 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 you start moving in this direction. That if we, if we start paying for quality, we'll get quality. Thanks. Okay, well, now you can see why I'm glad I met these people. Let me just say I'm extremely proud to, to know them, and I'm unqualified to be in the same corner of the room they're in, so I'm going to turn this away from me as soon as possible, but I did want to mention the one lament I have, and that is we have one more member of our group that we were not able to get there. It turns out it's really hard to get this many organizations to be in one city in one time, and we probably did use up a few freaking flyer models to pull this off, but the one most recent addition is Donna Caton Behensky, who is the President and CEO of the University of Wisconsin uh, Medical Center, Hospital and Clinics. Let me just say for an academic institution to join this kind of clarion call, and call for payment reform and all that stuff. Let's just say she's a loner in that world, and we're quite <laughs> proud of that. And also, I just want to say about the University of Wisconsin, it's the only medical school of which I'm aware where the School of Public Health and the medical school are actually under the same umbrella, and they have the highest representation of graduates who go off into primary care. So they've done a lot of stuff right, and we look forward to hearing from Donna in future meetings. So let me stop and take questions. Well, do we have a microphone? Are we playing that? Then let's just uh, agree to speak a little bit loud to be sure and stand. Tell us your name and affiliation, and uh, I'll open up the floor. Um, Restructure the payment system to move away from people service toward paying more for outcome and quality. What are the levers to do that? I mean, through Medicare, you can do that, Medicaid perhaps. But if you're talking about moving beyond the government programs and changing the way the entire system, what, how do you envision this occurring? What would be the federal role, perhaps even the role of a public plan in trying to drive some of these things? Public. 
See, Ron always asks simple questions, but that's exactly why we want people who run real systems. So let me just turn it over to the group. Uh, Nick, you want to go first? You thought about this a fair bit? MedPAC better than all that? Well, I mean, I think one of the thoughts is that um, Medicare uh, can be a huge lever. Uh, trying to come out of the blocks with um, all private uh, plans and Medicare doing the same thing uh, in unison is probably not realistic. However, uh, Medicare is such a, uh, a huge lever that if we can introduce some of these things uh, through Medicare, I think that over time they can be adopted uh, more broadly. Uh, you had a second part to your question, which was, I think, even more difficult to answer. What was that? It, it, well, it was, it was just whether, how, how you know this idea of the private marketplace and whether a public plan, as people are talking about as far as health care reforms, could be a vehicle for uh, going beyond the medical population. Yeah, that, was, that, that is a more difficult question because the, the points of view about the public plan are uh, obviously quite polarized right now. Uh, a public plan, however, uh, could be another lever in that it could perhaps introduce innovations uh, that maybe Medicare hasn't yet. Uh, it could be a, a place where uh, uh, we really look at how we design a benefit design differently if it were looked at a bit differently than Medicare. But of course, we're really caught in that discussion between those who think it's just one step to a single payer system versus those who think it could be a place for innovation. So I, I don't know how that one's going to end up. But it, there's some potential there, assuming it could be designed in a way that would be uh, acceptable uh, to, to private plans in particular. Wade, do you want to? Yeah. The, um it's really, it starts with a very simple question, how good of a job am I doing? Or how good of a job did you do? And then you have to figure out how to answer that. So our um, program, our, uh, our new project in Sacramento gets to your point, and so we have a large provider, hospital provider like Catholic Healthcare West, now working in conjunction with a health physicians, a large uh, physician group linked up with uh, Blue Shield, uh, the payer. And with the uh, CalPERS, which is so big it's almost indescribable as the second largest purchaser of healthcare services in the United States. And, so, and we're, as uh, was uh, described, we're, we're moving forward on how do you structure uh, that type of partnership to get to the question of how good a job are you doing? And the, it grew out of a very interesting two-year fight which at some point involved attorneys until we asked them to leave, which was CalPERS and with their partner uh, Blue Shield wanted to know how good of a job your CHW is doing patients in Sacramento or with the major provider. Um, and they wanted to see our data. And we said, well, we can't show you our data because of antitrust issues associated with uh, and, uh, negotiating issues with other uh, payers. So we went back and forth, and finally uh, I asked the question, well, if, you, if we provided you that data, what would you do with it? And the answer was, we don't know, but we think we need it. And our res my response was, well, we don't know what we would do with it either. So why don't we figure it out? So it's, it's the setting up of the partnership, which follows an integrated model of finance and position in hospitals and repairs that uh, has the answer to the question you raised of moving it out of the Medicare world, which is a little bit more controllable, into the private sector. Nick, you want to add? Yeah, the, the issue of tactics is, is kind of interesting to me because this is so complicated and there's so many ideas on the table. But one thought I've had is if we could move fairly quickly to a much larger scale uh, implementation of payment models around accountable care organizations. It may only be 15% of <coughs> providers right now, but they would be ready uh, to accept new payment models much more quickly uh, than in the more fragmented uh, areas of healthcare delivery. But in those more fragmented areas, if we took the top five or six DRGs by volume and cost, bundled those payments with Part B, and then made those an episode that included 30 days of care postoperatively. Just do it in the five or six highest volume DRGs. And also, don't do this as a demo in four states. Uh, implement it in some more scalable way, in more widespread way. Uh, 
I think we would see a tremendous amount of change begin very quickly in how providers look at working with one another. Uh, in complexity theory, that would be something like small changes can be, uh, small things can lead to very large changes. And if you think about the 1990s, think about all the organizations that were formed when they thought that home health reform and application might become uh, a more wide scale. It was really quite remarkable how quickly that all occurred. And so uh, there's a certain um, there's a certain benefit to simplicity and which tactics can lead to the biggest changes most quickly. And once you start forming uh, organizational approaches to coordination of care for Medicare, obviously the, those organizations create relationships. They put physicians and hospitals in the same place. You create governance structure. You have ways to accept payment. Things can really go from there. So that would be one way to think about tactics. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Oliver Alabaster. I'm a retired professor of medicine from GW, currently doing some entrepreneurial work. Um, I, as you can tell, come from England. I've worked in the national healthcare system in Britain, came to the NIH, worked in, if you like, the government system at NIH for six years, and then went to GW, which was the private system. My main focus has been on research, mainly cancer research, but I did do quite a lot of clinical work have a great interest in the current debate going on. To me, having worked in a nationalized healthcare system, that was, for me, from a professional point of view, one of the highlights of my life, actually, in many ways, in terms of the ability to deliver good care to patients. Now, contrary to what you might hear, a nationalized healthcare system can actually work very well, but there are patches and areas where, clearly, there is gross underfunding. I want to make the point that a nationalized healthcare system doesn't have to be bad, it just has to be well run. Mm -hmm. And uh, often I think in a debate, people reflexly reject any form of central payer system, nationalized system, go on, let's get the government out of healthcare kind of thing, which in, to me just absolutely falls flat. I mean, to me it is so unconvincing, because if you think about it, and, and I know this is very provocative, and forgive me for this, but it doesn't hurt. It's okay, you have an accent, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I feel that in many respects, what we've been living with is the worst form of socialized medicine. And this is nothing to do with these distinguished panel you have, who clearly are the exceptions that prove the rule. I mean, I listen to what are clearly very impressive performances uh, of their particular sectors of the industry in an environment which has not essentially worked. So what we're looking at here is a very exceptional uh, group of people. What we are faced with, though, is a, the whole morass of healthcare and where it's failing. And somebody, I think the gentleman from Japan said, 50% of the budget is actually essentially wasted. So no nationalized healthcare system could possibly do worse than that. So what we have is a private healthcare system which has inherently failed in many respects. It has the, the, the failures, the marking of failure is very comparable to what is justified to reject nationalized healthcare. In other words, we don't want a bureaucracy. We don't want waste. But what are we listening to? Bureaucracy and waste. That's what we're dealing with. In my view, one should not confuse a, a, an attempt to provide healthcare for all, and possibly even a single payer system, with the fact that it may be difficult to implement. Right now, you have, as I said, I was about to say, we have a socialized system where the government essentially is the healthcare industry, which is in, in, in the regional government controlling nearly a fifth of the economy. They cannot be unelected. They're immensely powerful. Uh, the, the, the elected representatives are terrified of them. Uh, making healthcare reform, good healthcare reform extremely difficult. And I'm quite pessimistic that anything meaningful will come out of it, actually. I mean, there may be patchwork solutions here and there. But inherently, I think that as the only country in the Western world that doesn't have a nationalized healthcare system, I don't know that we can avoid facing up to this one day, may not be this time around, but maybe it'll be five, ten years from now when the when the situation gets just so unmanageable that you don't have a choice. But I think I've probably gone on long enough, but I think you get a general point that I think that we shouldn't reflexly reject things. We should look for ways to make them work better. And in my experience, and I perhaps could quote one other example, the Pentagon healthcare system. Eleven million people are controlled by that. Uh, it's the size of a small European country. Uh, everybody I've spoken to who's being treated under the Pentagon Healthcare System actually is very positive about it. And it's a government-run system. 
Uh, I don't know enough about the details of its cost effectiveness, but um, I guess if the Pentagon's controlled, maybe it's not very efficient, but I had no data to support that. You probably know much more than I do. Anyway, I think I've said enough. Thank, thank you very much. I no, appreciate that. And one thing I like about modern technology and events is we have that on tape. We're going to use that. So I'm glad to meet you. Anybody would like to respond, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, only briefly, I would like to just comment on the fact that uh, First, the government is a very influential participant in our healthcare industry as it is. Uh, and so we have to be careful not to characterize this as, you know, the government's involved or the government's not, because it's really not a fair characterization. Uh, second, though, there are features of a well-run care delivery system, uh, and we've been trying to talk about what those features are, that really don't necessarily have anything to do with whether the government's spending the money or the money's being spent through an insurance plan or it's paid somewhere else. And so I think we have to be careful to presume, however we're making this argument about the government's role, that uh, it's really not the flow of funds so much as how the funds flow to create incentives for care delivery systems to work the way that they should. That's just very good. Very good. Yes, ma'am. For the Leech Library of America Action Center, I think, if I don't misunderstand, I think most of you are from urban practices. So I hear a lot of absolutely no need for service. But to talk about the people, the providers that are in the small towns, uh, consistently their costs are high. So I'm interested in how you would deal with that. I'm also interested in knowing, just from a, a personal, as you say, question, it's very clear that women have been overcharged in their insurance for a long, long time. And it's very clear that we do not have choice in terms of our doctors right now, because our insurance companies dictate which doctors we're allowed to go and expect we benefit whatsoever from those insurance companies. So those are my questions. Okay, well, Nick, since you're kind of uh, out there where there's a little bit of rural going on, I'll let you start with how we, how we move rural into the new payment incentive structures. And I'll stop us too. Yeah, I, uh, I actually find it interesting when um, the issue that, well, some of this doesn't work very well in rural America comes up, and I'll take the delivery system issue to start with. Some of the best integrated healthcare systems in the United States are in rural Pennsylvania, rural Wisconsin, and rural Montana. In our organization, we have uh, eight or ten rural health clinics. We manage six critical access hospitals. Three of them are becoming formal part of our organization. They all have our information system, and, uh, and, you know, uh, implemented. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity for rural America to be part of the reorganization of the delivery system. And in some cases, delete it because frequently in rural America, the physician hospital relationships are less troubled, uh, if not actually quite close and quite positive. And so there's a lot happening out there in rural America. Uh, in Montana, I would say our experience is that rural health care costs are, are clearly less uh, than in urban areas overall. Uh, the issues are workforce, uh, infrastructure and aging facilities and by workforce not just physicians but nurses and others I mean there's lots of issues in rural health but I, I, I don't really see uh, rural per se being a barrier to the changing world that we need to move into. Patty, you want to talk anything? Hmm? I think it means that many more people are going to get left behind. I don't think that needs to be the case. It might need to be that there are more partnerships like I'm talking about where consortiums of rural institutions or rural church or partnerships developed so that appropriate resources uh, can be led. And there's actually a lot of that happening right now in some parts of the country. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that rural uh, individuals will not be left behind. Okay, and, and I would uh, underscore the uh, relationship part. We have relationship with providers in the mountains, for example, in Colorado. Uh, who have trouble with resources, with workforce, and by linking up with us, they're able to keep patients in their hospitals that five years ago would have had to be shipped out of those communities when they got really sick because they didn't have the support of specialists or uh, systems behind them. So 
I actually think this concept, of, particularly with technology now that's available, can really enable linkages of urban and rural and even frontier communities in uh, ways that we hadn't imagined in the past. Tony, you want to speak to, I know you're in my home county in Arkansas, you want to talk rural. I'm from a town of 2,000 people. We were the county seat. People thought I was a city <laughs> slicker growing up. And Tony's in a town smaller than mine in my county, so go ahead. The only thing I'd, I'd add to uh, what Pat and, and Nick had indicated is because we are in rural America as well, and, and we've been able to uh, keep costs down, provide high quality care using telemedicine, for example, and we've got a very robust uh, uh, specialty service, referral service that, that we offer uh, to rural America. So I, I'm pretty confident that we are, in fact, uh, providing great care uh, at, uh, at very cost in, in those areas and, and are capable of doing even better. Okay, somebody want to speak to the provider choice issue because that seems to be, that was the second part of your question. How do we maintain some kind of semblance of uh, consumer control over, over provider choice? And I know that's a very complicated and controversial issue, but one obviously we need to address. So uh, who would like to jump in there? Mike? Well, I mean, I'll, uh, I think that there were perhaps two insurance-related questions you raised. The, the, the first, which was the easier one, had to do with gender rating. Why is it, you know, that insurance companies charge women more for coverage than they do for men? And that really is, is, is kind of a, uh, um, another form of health status rating. Women um, have babies, and that's very, very expensive. Um, and it's our view, and frankly, the the uh, abuse supported by the major industry trade associations that if we move to a system of you know uh, uh, mandated coverage for everybody that we can we can do away with that we can do away with health status rating we can do away with uh, with gender rating as well um, you know on the on, on the, the the physician choice issue um, I mean obviously. Uh, you, you know the, and you know we can we can provide lower cost coverage to people through narrow networks, which limit your choice to some degree. Uh, but I don't, you know, I think I mean you know, um, I, I really don't have a good answer to that. I'm not quite sure, you know, what your specific concern is. They just got discuss these uh, choices for that pro. Picking a panel yeah. is part of, I would say, the quality production decision, and that's really, uh, in a sense, a trade-off that's going on. But how do you maintain the appropriate, um, I would say, feeling of choice when you are having to limit um, who you have? Because it turns out they're not all as good as others. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to respond other than to say that um, we uh, we do build a uh, set of relationships with a network of providers uh, and we do uh, judge which providers should be within our network and which shouldn't based on a series of uh, measures usually regarding the quality of their clinical outcomes uh, and one issue is that we have enough of a mix of different types of providers to match the patient profile that, that we're serving uh, but I would just say we're highly motivated to deal with those issues. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, gender uh, match. Sometimes it's uh, ethnic match. Uh, there are other ways in which our care system doesn't really match the profile of the patients that we serve. But we're constantly striving to try to make that match better. I think Peter, yeah, go ahead. I'm Peter McMahon, I'm a health economist from Summer County, Maryland, and I've been in Washington since 1972. Uh, and although I'm an economist and I think finance is, financing is important, I've actually worked a lot with doctors about quality of care. And I was involved in the SRO program back in the early to mid 70s. I worked with Bob Brook, who's now at Iran, Mark Jason, who's now at uh, KCHO, and even Jack Weinberg briefly when I was at Hickman before he started in Ireland. But I can 
tell you, I wrote a speech for a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health in 1975, and I quoted a New York Times story that said, one-third of all surgeries in the United States were unnecessary. And since that time, the unnecessary or not productive or a little value amount of services has ranged, it seems to me, from 25% up to the third, and now 50%. I've worked with a lot of very clever, very bright, well-intentioned people, all of whom were committed to things like comparative effectiveness research and um, physician standards, even before that, those were the terms of art being used. But the number stays the same. And why is why is it going to be any different? Why, why are you optimistic that 10 years from now, it won't still be 30% or 25%? I, I, I'm a little bit pessimistic simply because I've been at it so long and everyone says it's going to get better and we keep getting the same numbers. Well, first of all, send me your speech. I'd love to read it. But, uh, well, I, I think one of the reasons is that we kept the for service throughout most of this time. And I don't think that's complex. If you pay for widgets, you'll get a lot of widgets. And so I think that as long as we pay for doing things, people will do things. And uh, it contributes to misuse and overuse, I think, uh, tremendously. I think the uh, two other things that weren't there in the past that are here now is I do think that as I said in my comments, healthcare is an information business. And really, un until recently, and even in most uh, practices now, information isn't really available in a usable way. But as we become more sophisticated, I think with uh, health information technology, the availability of uh, not just data, but information at the point of care in usable ways, I think, will help tremendously. Um, our order sets have helped tremendously in our, our system. And it's not that people didn't want to do the right thing. It's at 3 in the morning. Who remembers what the right thing is? So I, I think that that will help. And I think the third difference is there's much more trends there will be much more transparency. And I think that will aid in overusing issues. So I think those three things, getting away from fee for service, having real information at the point of care, using information technology effectively, more transparency, what is it look a different place than we've been before? Um, in addition to what, to what Pat said, I'm very optimistic because uh, as if you saw or heard from, from our statistics that we're a private practice model and we have gotten tremendous results in partnering with our physicians when we sit down and talk about creating a culture of safety uh, and what are we in this business for? We're really here to take care of the patient. Let's put this patient at the center of all of our decisions and everything we do. Let's take the finances out of it. Um, and I think that you know we've had extremely successful results and, and results from other uh, models uh, of, of uh, physician partnership. I think uh, together with technology, I think we're in uh, the right time to make these dramatic moves. And I think uh, uh, all of our clinicians and all of our administrators are, are in lockstep. Nick, you want to add? Yeah, I think, I think two things are different now from 1975, two big things. One is we don't have any choice. <laughs> more so than 1975, and I know that was said back then too. I think people worried about healthcare costs as they presented to the GDP in the 1930s. I think there are um, speeches from then. But we really don't have a lot of choice right now. The second thing is we know a lot more. We do have more evidence about, uh, some people call it the science of healthcare delivery, but we do know how to take care of an episode of cardiac care. We do know how to reduce ventilator required pneumonias to zero. We do know how to reduce admissions for populations of people with congestive heart failure by 50 and 60%. And that's being done. It's being done at Geisinger and Intermountain Healthcare and Denver Health. And so what is it about our inability to take what we know and implement it on a large scale? That's really the problem. 
but we know what to do. And this time, I think we're going to find a way to do it, but it will be painful. Wait, you were to do this guy. This, this gets to a problem which we've been noodling about and puzzling about for a long time. It, it gets to the issue of why haven't we improved healthcare in America, even though we've been talking about it for 100 years. And the best we can figure out, kind of from a, a, a political symbolism point of view, is that in, in Americans' minds, the healthcare is characterized by a doc with a black bag, whether it's you know, a guy from the 19th century with a handlebar mustache or Marcus Willoughby or whatever. There's a single person in it with a black bag, but, but, and, and, but the problem has been there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot in that black bag. There's a stethoscope in that black bag for the most part. But that's still an image of which gives people comfort. And we think a lot of political judgments are made in relationship to that. But so the black bag, has, there has to be a new black bag. The new black bag is a laptop of a camera. You flip that puppy open and there's a split screen with a number of people who are being all consulted at the same time while your medical record streams down on the right hand side. And it's that type of teamwork which represents the new tools in the black bag. And we get to that as kind of a normative idea. Then we get to the uh, point of how do you really control all the silliness we've been uh, engaged in for quite some time. Scott. Yeah, just, I think very briefly building on Nick's uh, second point, we have evidence today uh, that there is opportunity to make dramatic changes in the overall cost of care. If you just look at the variation from one region in our country to another in our Medicare Advantage uh, or Medicare programs, uh, where systems of care have been able to deliver on dramatically better clinical outcomes at 50% of the overall cost. So the question is, what's happening in those markets that needs to be emulated in other markets across the country? The evidence is there that we can deliver on it. Can you, can you uh, disseminate the uh, best practice uh, is now the question. Yes, yeah, hi. Uh, my name's David Nixon. I work with the Liberty Political Action Committee and representing Executive Intelligence Review as well. And I sort of feel like uh, at the moment like the child from the story of the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, because I wanted to ask the panel a question <coughs> regarding the methodology that's being used by key administration, White House officials who are working on this, people like Peter Orsag. Uh, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, Richard Thaler, uh, who have been working very diligently to find a, a reform for the healthcare system based on reducing uh, the rate of increase in the budget, uh, which obviously is Peter Gorsog's intention as the manager of the budget. But the way that this has been done largely in their research has been through the use of comparative effectiveness and clinical effectiveness research, which was brought up earlier in the panel. Um, and they particularly mentioned that they're basing their work on the work of the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in Great Britain, which oversees the approved uh, procedures for the National Health Service in Britain. But I find this methodology to be rather disturbing because it takes uh, mathematical techniques like game theory uh, as well as you know, probabilistic kinds of calculus, such as the measurement of quality of the best of life years or dailies, uh, to, to issue guidelines for whether care will be given to patients if their life is worth, in the end, the outcome of, of the treatment agrees with whether or not their quality adjusted life here uh, suits the, the cost of the treatment. Um, so what's your question? My, my question is how do, you, how do you respond to a procedure for something like clinical effectiveness research, which is implicitly deciding on treatments by measuring whether or not a person's life is worth saving or not in monetary terms. 
Sure, Jane, go ahead. By all means. Okay, being the fool that stumbles right into this one. Um, I, I actually think I think it's a different question in the U.S. You know, I, I think that people who get uh, very alarmed about comparative effectiveness research um, need to look at it in the U.S. context. We have a, a multi-payer context in the United States. It's not a single health system making these up or down decisions. And I, I would argue actually also that NICE in general hasn't made up or down decisions. They, they have been struggling with methodological issues and we will struggle with those here. Just because you don't know all the answers, sort of your point earlier, if you, if you don't know all the answers, it doesn't mean you shouldn't start. And as a research-based, scientifically-based organization, if, I mean, that's just not even how we, if we didn't know the answer, we would never start on researching anything at Mer. So it's not, it's not a way of moving forward. And I, I do think that you need to look at, it, it's a competitive model that we have here in the U.S., and Merck is obviously rooting for the continuation and a heightened competitive model in the U.S. where we're competing on value. So you're going to have payers and integrated health systems thinking about two things, thinking about cost and cost containment, thinking about outcomes, three things, and thinking about satisfied consumers, I mean, because that's part of a market dynamic. And so all of that's going to come to play. And Blue Shield of California is going to be competing with another insurer and using comparative effectiveness analysis and applying some measure of cost calculation to that in whatever way. And thinking about those three things sort of simultaneously. And how it's all going to play out, I don't know, but I, I think we sort of have to have faith that that's the dynamic that this is going into. And it's, it can only be a helpful tool. I mean, we're making decisions running blind now on you know what to cover, what to do. So I, I would just urge you to think about our context here. Great. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure when we're talking about health care if we are including mental health care oh, yes. in your discussion. And then I have another question. It seems to me that there's a simple idea here that's extremely important that gets lost in um, some of the deadly framing, and that is it seems to me systematically you are moving more uh, forcefully and focused to put um, management of patient care into the hands of people with medical training. I mean, because on the other end, typically it is a patient who is trying to navigate all of that and figure out who's the best doctor, what's the best means of care. And you're trying to bring some of the systematic. So I, I just think it would be extremely helpful to talk about this work this way. Um, and the other question, because part of me is that there's a patient pack that I've got on in responding to some of these ideas, um, is that when you talk about the example of getting your statin, having um, manage the care of a chronically ill child for 15 years and intercepted incorrectly written physician prescriptions, in, you know, correctly delivered pharmaceutical prescriptions, or dealt with the negative consequences of me missing those. I get very ner I get happy and nervous when I hear that automatic version. Because when your doctor sending that statin uh, pharmacy, do I get to see a copy of what he sent to the pharmacy to know if he sent the right thing or not? That, that would be, you know, because what's happening with that sort of quality care, the automation, I would assume, would reduce the number of errors, but then what's the catch? So those are sort of three Patty, you points. better go first, because I've seen your system in operation. Well, to answer a couple of us, I think you brought up a good point about mental health and uh, in two ways. At least in the Medicaid system, in most places, the delivery system for mental health is separate from the delivery system for physical health, and that has to end. We've talked about integrated systems, but to ask the most vulnerable people to manage two systems is really completely illogical, and um, we know that those patients who have mental illness often have more physical illness. So, you, you absolutely have to integrate that uh, care. I think, I hope we've learned that separate and equal doesn't work uh, in a variety of aspects of society, including. Is that uh, true just for you or across the board? Pardon me? Is that true just in your system or across the board? That they're separate. 
Well, I, I don't know. I've learned that lesson. I, I don't know. I hope others can learn it. Uh, but maybe if I keep saying it, others will learn it. Uh, 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 the patient's name, from a patient's point of view, what impressed me about that medical record exam, as I saw it when they took me around, was how easy it was for the patient to grasp. So. Right. Well, the other point that you're making is a very good one. When you have a siloed, fragmented system, the, the burden is on the patient and or their family to figure out how to coordinate the EE, the primary care, the specialist, the hospital, and what we're saying about integrated models is exactly what you're saying. That's done for the patients so that there's seamless flow of information and of their care. So that's a very uh, important point. I think the question of automation is actually automation if it's, if it's done correctly. I think eliminates a lot of the potential errors of handwritten prescriptions or handwritten orders uh, flowing. I know in our system where it's computerized order entry by the provider, so it's automatically checked for correct dose for uh, allergies, for weight-based dosing where that needs to be. Then it's barcoded so the patient, the nurse, and the drug are all together so that error doesn't happen. That everything is checked by the pharmacist as to deliver it. And at the same time, the, to the time for the order being written to the drug getting to the patient has been reduced by 70% so they get their care faster. So I think in these automated systems, you, you can build them so that you have many more checks and balance than you did in any handwritten kind of uh, model. Scott, you mentioned that 65% of group health uh, enrollees are participating in that. That's a um, I did mention that, and frankly, all I would be able to do is reiterate the points uh, already made about how there are these quality checks to deal with the concern you, you expressed about the quality of prescribing and so forth. But I did want to comment on another uh, point that you made, and that is your comment about uh, care management and the way it's sort of evolving. And I would certainly, I would very much agree with um, the, the idea that as we're looking at how integrated care delivery systems deliver on the results, part of what's happening is that we're moving a, a, from a mental model where care management is the function of nurses and doctors who judge referrals, you know, and, and decide whether it's a good referral or not a good referral or, you know, do a limited number to a place where the care management actually is incorporated quite directly into the care delivery system itself. Uh, and then in the best of all worlds, it becomes not just in the care system, but becomes within the relationship that the care system has with the patients themselves. And so I, you really, I thought you uh, touched on that point, and I think it's an excellent point that we probably don't emphasize enough. One more question. I'm sorry, I already gave you a shot, so yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jacob Johnson. I'm also with the, the Rouge Pack. Ah. Just a quick question. Brief, please. Uh, we already have an HMO system that's pretty broken, and you guys sound like you're exceptions to the rule. I'm actually very excited because it sounds very nice. How do we keep from all being covered under a universal insurance system that is an HMO system? Because IT technology it, it improves efficiency, cuts costs, but it doesn't necessarily stop you know, HMO from rationing care, which they already do. Maybe I would answer this to uh, enable our guests to get on to the next meeting we've got to take them to. I'll just say, remember Ronald Reagan? Trust, but verify. Yeah. What you're talking about here is a set of systems which we clearly believe can and should spread, where information is the best ally of the patient and the clinician and the payer. That's really what we mean by aligning incentives, but it doesn't work unless the patient has total confidence. And I would submit to you, sir, this country won't adopt anything where at least the large majority of people feel pretty comfortable. So thank you all for coming. Join me in picking our incredible